Welcome. I got you. Okay, welcome and uh, to our um, Ojai City Council and Ojai Redevelopment Agency Successor Agency regular meeting of May the 27th. Roll call. Councilmember Blatz. Here. Councilmember Clapp. Here. Councilmember Lara. Here. Mayor Pro Temp Smith. Here. Mayor Strobel. Present. And Councilmember Clapp, if you would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And tonight we have a, a proclamation declaring June 2014 as Lavender Month, and I'm going to read that. Whereas Ohio's Mediterranean climate makes it an ideal place to grow lavender, and whereas lavender has many uses, including medicinal, culinary, and artistic, and whereas the Ohio Lavender Festival is in its 11th year of bringing thousands of people to the Ohio Valley to learn about the wonders of, wonders of lavender, whereas the Lavender Festival provides fun activities for the whole family, live music, and speakers who provide both knowledge and entertainment for visitors. Whereas the Lavender Festival is held each year in June, excuse me, in Libby Park, and for 2014 will be held on June the 28th, 2014. Therefore be it resolved that I, Carlin Strobel, Mayor of the City of Ojai, and on behalf of the Ojai City Council, proclaim the month of June 2014, Lavender Month, and in doing so, urge all citizens to celebrate and learn about the many uses of lavender. Do we have anyone here for the... Okay. You can come up and get this, and if you'd like to say a few words. Yes, please talk. <laughs> I don't do reverse or anything. No, Well, on behalf of the Lavender Festival, we are tickled lavender to have you declare this, <laughs> to declare this month Lavender Month. And we hope it extends beyond 2014 because we'd like to make it last forever. And I, I, here with me tonight is Cindy Mullins, who's been the president of the corporation and the committee for many years and is doing such a wonderful job to bring this activity to Ojai. And I think we do it for a reason that allows us to not have to go to people for money to support it. And we put the money that we do make back into the community in mm -hmm. the form of scholarships. And this year we increased our scholarships from three to four. So we have four very fine young people who are getting $1,000 scholarships and those will be awarded at the festival. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you doing this because we're just thrilled. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tim Smith. Yes, I had a question actually if you want to come back up. So it <laughs> if someone was to go to the Lavender Festival in the park and spend four or five hours there, tell us what they would learn. Everything. Okay. <laughs> a little more specific. How to plant, how to prune, how to dry, how to what's the word we do when we turn it into liquid? Oh, uh, oils? Oh, no, no. Oils and liquids and cosmetics. We've got a speaker talking about permaculture this yeah. year. Oh, yes. Step right in. Mm -hmm, on aromatherapy. Mm -hmm. And we have another local who's going to talk, our, one of our favorite foodies, Karen Evenden, is going to talk about cooking with lavender, of course, and using it in many ways around her home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's we might even teach you how to weave a wreath. All right. <laughs> I sure missing one on your front door. <laughs> We just, uh, and there's activities for the kids. There's food, there's free parking, free shuttle, free admission. Mm -hmm. All of these things that will help bring people to Ojai and help them find out how wonderful this city is. 
Thank you. And I, I will comment that my favorite dessert is cream boulet, and I have had lavender cream boulet. It oh, is really? Pretty good, huh? Uh. It's good. <laughs> okay, next, um, Mr. Clark, we have an, an urgency item. Would it be best to take it now or after public communication? So, so my suggestion would be to decide now whether or not to put it on the agenda, but put it on the agenda under discussion items to discuss later. Okay, then let's take it up now. Okay, so um, Council Members Clapp and Mayor Pro Tem Smith have asked the City Council to add a discussion regarding tree pruning by subcontractors for the Southern California Edison Company. And this grew out of um, pruning activity which occurred after the uh, posting of the agenda. And they feel there's a need to act immediately before our next regular meeting and therefore they've asked that it be put on the um, City Council agenda tonight. Okay, so the recommendation is, is um, before the council is to determine uh, that issues regarding tree trimming by subcontractors for utilities arose after the publication of the agenda, and that action is required before the next regular council meeting. So we do that by. Maybe a supervisor would be take four fifths so to make the F find, make that finding. And then you need can a motion. And need a motion to do that with based on those findings. And if you get a four votes, then you can discuss the item. All right. So moved. Second. Roll call. Blatt. Yes. Clapp. Yes. Laura. Yes. Smith. Yes. Strobel. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and that will place it on the agenda. Right, so as mayor, you can decide when to discuss it. My recommendation would be that we put it on the list of discussion items and discuss it then. Let's do that, and um, at this time, let's take public communications. I don't have any cards unless I... Did you fill out a green card? No, I don't have one. Andrea, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> This is just a, a small note. Um, I think. Tell us, give us your name. Oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. My name's Andra Belknap. Um, a small note about the previous meeting. I think it would have been extremely helpful for members of the community to be able to see on this board the uh, item of the budget that was being discussed. I understand it was posted online, but of course it's you know over 100 pages long. No one wants to print out that huge amount of paper for one-time use and it's extremely easy to display on that board so that's just a suggestion thank you yes i'm sorry thank you um i do have a speaker card william ulrich good evening william ulrich 487 gridley road <clears throat> and re <clears throat> relative to the city's <coughs> previous um, meeting relative to budget and the reconfiguration of staff and the actual cost or uh, purported savings attributed thereto. Um, is the council aware that current city code allows installation of Class C f roofing on new construction in the city? That is wood shake roofs. Uh, has this been changed? Is anyone looking at changing this? Uh, it's a huge issue from a fire. This isn't dialogue, so go ahead with... Uh, I, I recognize that. I, I'm not asking for response. What is the st status of Councilman Blatt's request of City Manager Clark regarding a report on the AT&T Yukon cell tower application debacle? Where can it be accessed by the public? Golden State Water is responsible for testing and certification of Ojai Fire Water Delivery System. This system is not at present currently fully functional in the city I do not believe is aware of this condition what is the status of the golden weight Sys golden state system water system delivery system overall that is there's a new well on Grand Avenue new storage tank on Grand Avenue new main line on Grand Avenue and fire hydrants on Grand Avenue that are not currently online the fire system that Golden West has at excuse me the fire system at Golden West tract has a lost valve that is set in a bypass condition. What is the status of, such, of this valve? Has it been located? Has it been corrected? Overall, fire water system leaks exist throughout the city. Who is tracking this? Finally, 
no, I won't say finally, I make an observation. Given Ojai's large senior population, it appears that Mr. Clark has replaced a senior citizen as videographer with over 20 years service with a young millennial videographer for these public meetings. What is Mr. Clark's message here in a city that purportedly supports seniors? What is the status of city open access interactive website? The Ventura Local Agency Formation Commission, LAFCO, report of 11-14-12 was critical of Ojai's website accessibility. Cost of upgrade is $9,500. You just reviews the budget. What is the status? Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speaker cards I have for public communication. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to speak? Okay. Then we'll go to, let's do, let's take the consent calendar and then that'll take us to the discussion <coughs> items. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Blatt? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Lara? Yes. Smith? Yes. Strobel? Yes. All right, at this time, let's take up the, um, urgency item regarding tree trimming. Mr. Clark. Thank you. Um, council members, council member Clapp and Mayor Pro Tem Smith requested this item. And I'd like to go over two different situations that have occurred in recent weeks. First of all, um, Caltrans engaged a subcontractor to uh, trim trees along Highway 33, um, both in the unincorporated area and in the incorporated area of the city. And it was noted that the, um, it was pretty unartful. <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the cuts were severe and, uh, and probably excessive, and they were unesthetically done. And so we, we did ask um, Caltrans if they would um, stop and give us time to consult with them, and they actually did. And so uh, within the city limits, I should say, they've, they've stopped and they've given us the opportunity to provide input, and we're gonna be meeting with them on Thursday to provide that input. And uh, in the meantime, we've had input ourselves because we're not versed in um, arborism, <laughs> but we have got arborists to take a look at the cuts and to advise us as well as the tree committee. And so we're going to try to either convince them to let us do the cutting under the terms of our contract with Caltrans under which they reimburse us for work, um, or at the very minimum to get them to do a, a better job uh, of that cutting. Um, the second incident is the one that resulted in this item, and that is that um, the Southern California Edison Company has also engaged um, subcontractors to come out and trim trees that uh, uh, are conflicting with utility lines. Um, when this was brought to our attention, we did some research and we found out that our municipal code actually has a section in it that requires that they provide certain things to us each year before they do um, routine maintenance. And that is um, they're, they're to provide notification of their maintenance activities, including a map of facilities to be maintained, schedule of work to be performed, site plan of protected trees that might be affected, a report from a certified arborist describing tree trimming methods and standards to be used, and certifications of qualifications of tree workers and supervisors. Um, none of that's been provided, um, and so I've asked them to stop work until it's been provided. Um, they are, the, the Edison Company seems less interested in working with us, at least at this point, and they are gonna stop, but they're gonna um, try and provide that information very rapidly and proceed on. Their concern, as they relate it to me, is fire safety and the governor's proclamation of, of drought-related fire dangers and so forth. And I have told them that we would cooperate with them in any situations where the cutting that they're doing um, is because of an extreme fire-related um, problem. So that's where things stand right now. And maybe the council members would like to comment, uh, or if you have questions, the city attorney and I will do the best to answer we can to answer, although we have not done that much research yet. Council member Clapp, would you like to comment on this? <coughs> well, yeah, I did call 
Mr. Clark, when I saw the kind of pruning that was going on on Highway 33, which I don't know if other folks have noticed, but it's been re really extremely done. And when I learned that they were just about ready to head around the corner and head down Maricopa Highway towards uh, the canyon with their chainsaws <laughs> in tow, and that they were planning to attack the um, all those um, probably 100, 125 year old eucalyptus trees in front of Nordoff. And if you drive down 33, you'll notice that the eucalyptus trees that they pruned on the highway, they just come along and they just cut them off. Just right straight across. So when I had a vision of them attacking those trees like that over on in front of Nordoff, I had visions of this council chambers being full of a bunch of very irate people. And I called Rob and I said, we gotta stop this. And so he's been really good about it, communicating with Caltrans and getting them to stop and investigating what we found in our own ordinance, which are requirements that, that we have communication with people before they prune. The question is whether or not we have any control over Caltrans. Um, and I've also done some of my own research, and I've given this to everybody here as well as the press. There's two of them up there as well that could be maybe passed around to people in the audience about different kinds of programs that are available, um, and this is not, apparently not an unusual problem because there's communities all over the country that are dealing with, dealing with uh, utilities coming in and how they're managing the trees around power lines. And we're Tree City USA, so one of the first things I did was look in to the website to see if there was any sort of policy around utility pruning because in order to be a Tree City, we have to have best practices here in town, and in order to maintain our status, we have to be managing our urban forests properly. And I did find in the, uh, in the uh, Tree City USA Arbor Day Foundation website that there is a Tree Line USA management program, and there's also training done uh, by the International Society of Arbor Arboriculture for specifically a certified arborist utility specialist. And there, and so I have this all printed out. It's really quite interesting that there are policies and ways that this can be done in a, in a manner that doesn't destroy the integrity of the tree, the beauty of the tree, but at the same time uh, maintain safety for the community for fire hazard. So Mr. Clark was very um, helpful, as was Hannah Beth Jackson's office, because um, I was told by Steve Bennett to that I might have some luck stopping Caltrans if I called Hannah Beth's office. And I did. And between Rob and Hannah Beth's office, we got them stopped. But then, interestingly enough, and, and just for, the, for transparency's sake, ironically, the day before um, this happened to me, I was talking to Rob about a tree in my front yard. And I was talking about how every year I have a certified arborist and tree pruner come in and manage my trees including a shoestring acacia that's in my front yard. Well, oddly enough, I went to work on Thursday. Friday morning I came out and I had a cup of coffee in hand and there was debris all over my front yard. And I thought, what the heck? Well, I looked up. SCE had come in and cut my tree in half. And it's not even under a power line. And I was like, totally astonished. I thought, how did they find, did the tr tree pruners pick my house out after I called about Caltrans butchering the trees on 33? <laughs> it was just so bizarre. It was so ironic. So then again, I called and I went out with uh, Greg Grant and we, the SCE, head of the SCE came out and we had a discussion about the policies of, of tree pruning and and such by utilities, and so this sort of got this whole thing rolling. So it was a kind of a combination, a perfect storm of recognizing that not only was Caltrans doing an improper job of pruning, they were also doing an improper job by the utilities. And uh, that very same day that I talked to the guy from SCE up on North Kenyatta, they were up there with chainsaws and were doing the same thing with another tree. They had just come in and completely just topped off a tree with. Um, just unbelievable, you know, neglect. So I was called Councilwoman uh, Smith and I said, you wouldn't believe what's going on. You know, I've been talking to her over the several days about the uh, Caltrans incident and 
and she and I were discussing how horrible it was and how you really permanently damage a tree and you can also shorten its life and why are you pruning right in the nesting season why are you pruning in a drought right before the summer and so then when I, my tree got butchered I called her up and I said this, you know we've got to do something because the damage has already been done to these trees the damage has been done to my tree but anybody out there that has a tree they could come home and have the same thing and then nobody should have to come home and have their tree completely you know butchered by somebody who doesn't care about the heart and soul that you put into your tree in your yard and incidentally my tree is not in the public right away nor was it under power lines it was on my private property so I'm really glad that Councilman Smith agreed to bring this forward and I hope that the rest of council agrees that we need to do something as, as soon as possible because a chainsaw can do damage permanent damage in a very short period of time and I think we all agree that we love our trees in this valley and that we want cared for properly so thank you Mayor Pro Tem Smith did you want to add anything um, I just wanted to say that once councilman and Councilwoman Clapp brought it to my attention. I started looking. I said, oh, my God. I don't know how many of you have noticed what they've done on 33. It's outrageous. I mean, some of those trees will just up and die. They were, they were trimmed so badly. So uh, it's, once again, the Republic of Caltrans doing whatever, whatever they, they, uh, they choose in a way that's uninformed. This community doesn't know, and it's certainly not best practices. I mean past incidences with Caltrans. I mean, I think there was a paving issue on Maricopa Highway. We just got done doing a great job, and the next day there's Caltrans drilling into the brand new, into the brand new uh, pavement. So communication doesn't seem to happen. So I, I think this is the way to go, to exactly that we stop and we actually insist on best practices and notification. Mr. Clark, did you did you mention earlier that Caltrans was um, responsive to our plight here? Yes, Cal Caltrans <laughs> did agree to stop uh, the trimming within the city limits until we had an opportunity to consult with them. And we will be consulting with them on Thursday. And Edison? And Edison, um, it's all happened pretty quickly because it just came up today. But um, Edison understands that they have not met the requirement of our code, and so they're trying. So they're they're not going to proceed without following the code. They said. So, so they're going to. They said they're going to try and get everything to us by the end of the business day tomorrow, so that they can proceed again. So that's that's from um, someone who's at the arborist le level within Caltrans, and I don't know if if higher policy levels will have a different feeling or or how that'll play out. To what exempt are the utilities company, uh, to what extent are they exempt from our municipal codes? Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, they're generally not exempt um, from um, things like our, our tree policies. Um, they, but but they, they um, also have requirements under the Public Utilities Code and the Public Resources Code in PUC regulations about maintaining safety zones around power lines, and they have the obligation to um, to to uh, to to make that that air, those areas safe. Then there's the only time we get into a, a true a true exemption is if there's something in our regulations that prevent them from complying with PUC regulations, and we don't have that for two reasons. One, um, we require them only at this point they have to get an annual permit from the city, and do this on an annualized basis. Um, and so if they plan ahead for regular routine maintenance, there's nothing incompatible between our ordinance and the PC regulations about doing that. Further, there's an express exemption for emergencies, that if there's an emergency situation that requires them to do something, particularly if there's a, a, a tree or a growth is discovered and it's during a high wind period and needs to be taken down, then they have the authority. We, we, our code recognizes uh, their authority to do that. And that's true. With, I, I was, today, since I've been working this with the city manager, I've been looking at other city ordinances for cities that have tree protection ordinances like ours. Um, and there's a wide range of ways to deal with this. Some simply exempt um, any work by a public utility in compliance with PC regulations. Um, ours is, is more carefully drafted. Um, but it does require them to um, comply and get a permit. By, and by getting a permit means they must comply with our, for, our urban forestry standards requirements for 
for tree trimming and tree printing um, designs to be approved by the city. In this case, it would be the public works director because it uh, depends if, the way our code works. If it's on private property, it's community development director. If it's on public property, it's the city the public works director. Um, so they have to get a permit and comply. I think the issue facing us right now is is whether Caltra or whether Edison would take the position that they're in an emergency situ situation and something has to be done. And my advice to the manager has been we need them to document that there is some urgent emergency that has arisen that they weren't prepared, that they couldn't have been taken care of through an annualized permit. So they're not outright exempt, but they do it. They have to work between two sets of regulations, our local regulations and and state and PUC regulations. But right now, I don't think there's anything. Our regulations are are not incompatible with PUC, so in my opinion, they have to comply with both. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Clapp. Sorry, could, I was going to have one more point before we begin. Because um, the question raised by Councilmember Clapp is interesting. The, the authority that the Edison Company has, all utilities have, for trimming is only for to, to create safe clear zones around uninsulated transmission lines. And depending on the height of the pole and the amount of uh, the voltage of the line, it's anywhere, anywhere from 4 to 12 feet clear area around a, uh, a, a wire. So it's a function of how tall the pole. I mean, so the, the, and there's a PUC regulations that describe the, the safe zone area around the, around the wire that has to be cleared. Um, when it comes to private property, there's two issues. It, you know, there's, you know, almost all properties where we have over, overhead wires, there is a public utility easement uh, up roughly either two and a half or five feet on either side of the, pro of, the, of the pole in which they have the absolute right to control what gets planted and maintained in that, in that, in that public utility easement. Um, and then there separately is a theoretical possibility you could have a tree growing on entirely on private property which is growing towards the wires in which they have to, they still, I, under the PUC regulations, have the authority to trim. Um, we also know, we do know that Edison keeps a list of property owners who've requested to be notified um, of trimming activities, which means two things to us. One, in the absence of a, of, of a request, they don't, they don't notify property owners they're going to be trimming trees. Um, and secondly, they apparently are very careful in protecting that list of, and, and it, as, as far as we know, they are very good, also good about respecting that list and notifying people in advance when they do want to trim. So I think and one thing we'll, we'll work out for the council, the community, is finding out how to get on the Edison notice list so at least they have to follow their own internal procedures and notify property owners before they come out and, and do any trimming. Again, unless there's an urgent emergency. Council Member Clapp. I was told by the supervisor of SCE that they are required to notify they are required to notify a property owner if they are going to prune a tree on private property, which they didn't do in my case. So I, that's something that uh, Mr. Grant is apparently finding out whether that's truly the policy or not. Um, the other thing on our ordinance that is of concern to me is like so many ordinances, and you understand as an attorney, it's all about the devil being in the details. Um, they say that the, um, a report from a certified arborist describing tree trimming methods and standards to be used and certifications and qualifications of tree workers and supervisors. and. It says that this is required, and it's interesting because the SCE supervisor again said all of their, they have an arborist and, and everybody's trained and all the, prune, the tree pruners are trained and, and to prune a tree properly. So even though we're saying that this is required here, whether in practice they do it or not is a whole other story, and clearly they're not. So one of the things that I'm wondering we, if we may want to consider is tightening this up a little bit and having part of it be, and I know this would cost money, I don't know how to do it, but, but um, there's got to be some third-party supervision to make sure that it's done properly because it doesn't take but five minutes to destroy a tree. And when somebody stands there and tells you, oh, this tree has been pruned beautifully and, and I just didn't fall off the turnip truck. I could look up there and tell that it wasn't done properly. So I think that we really do need to consider tightening it up to make sure that in practice that this really occurs, not just on a piece of paper that they say they're going to do it. And I'd like to comment, and then I'll, I'll go to you. And that is, I suspect that Southern California Edison Correct me if I'm wrong. I know you're back there, Mr. Grant. Um, has 
had a free hand for many, many years so that they pretty much take as their right because of so many years unchallenged. They, they take as their right to, to do what they have been doing year after year after year. So I have two things. One, do we have their attention? And two, um, let's keep their attention and whatever the city needs to, to do, whether that is uh, be more strict with our oversight as far through public works or code enforcement. And I would like, even though it's after the fact, I would like for an arborist on behalf of the city to inspect the damage that has already been done so that we have more than just our say-so. I would like to have arborist reports of how we may possibly have damaged those trees. Council Member Laura. Madam Mayor, and I appreciate, first of all, Mayor Pro Tem Smith and Council Member Claps for bringing this up. I think it's, it, I've noticed it every year. They do it every year. And being in the business of landscaping, <coughs> I've learned a thing or two about trees. The other thing that, that, that puts us in a bind is, <coughs> I'm glad you asked those questions about what their safety regulations are, what it's supposed to 12 to 15 feet. A lot of people plant their trees next to electric lines outside. So in, in also in a sense, it's the due diligence of, of our citizens planting the trees in the right location or allowing <laughs> an oak tree to grow in the right location because again and again we plant the wrong tree. And, and the thing that I worry about eucalyptus tree is, is if, if you let it to a certain point, they're, they're fragile. If you don't trim him, it's, it's, I mean, it, there's safety hazard. So we need to be careful on not only, I mean, my, my suggestion would be getting on that list of whatever Edison or Caltrans and having them notify us and working with their arborists. And I, I just want to try to careful that we're not putting so much energy when, when we know that we don't have any jurisdiction when it comes to safety <coughs> zone. Meaning, are we putting all this effort in there if, if they're still going to do it because they're allowed to do it in the 12 to 15 feet zone that they consider as a safety? Uh, because I feel like a lot of our trees might be in that safety zone already, and they might have a, a, the right to do it anyways, even if we... Uh, do our, our our own thorough investigation about trees and getting our arborists. So th that's my only concern. I really do. I, I I think that we do need to have the, get their attention and do need to talk about their practices because it is true. A lot of the trees that they trim, they do it wrong. They absolutely do it wrong. So, uh, but I do appreciate you guys bringing it up, and it's I guess the desire of the council if they if they agree that we want to have the third part or the, our own arborists go around town and seeing uh, how we could uh, ramp up the ordinance, I'd be in favor, so. And to my way of thinking, in just a second, to my way of thinking, as long as we make no objection, business will continue mm -hmm. as it has, mm -hmm. so. If we require these things for the protection of our city, then maybe a little thought will be given before this type of thing is, is uh, happens again. Uh, Council Member Clapp? Uh, just to address a couple of things that Mr. Lar brought up, there there's a, an ordinance and it's in the, the handout or the emergency item or whatever you call it. It's Benicia, the city of Benicia's ordinance. and, and they say pruning for clearance of utility lines and energized conductors shall be performed in compliance with the current version of the American National Standards Institute, which I don't know what that is. But basically he's saying such pruning 
may be inspect inspected by the city arborist to ensure that proper pruning practices are followed. So there are ordinances where there is a standard around utility lines that's required and also as that a city arborist is present to make sure that it's done properly. So uh, obviously they've had their own set of problems as well. So I think you can prune properly around power lines even though the, the trees have either been planted too close or you know whatever happens happens but that there is a standard that, that can be done in a manner that is mitigating the chance of fire but also is is done in a manner that's proper and I think that's mostly what I'm talking about and you're absolutely right about where you do plant a tree you know that's very critical which is why I planted the tree where I planted it I thought it was safe <laughs> so yeah thank you any other comments no. Okay, so I think you get the, the general idea that you have the council support to, to do something. Now, what should that something be? Well, yeah, I, I, think, I think with Caltrans, our first attempt will be to get them to allow us to do the um, pruning and um, them pay for it through our uh, contract. If they don't do that, then I think we'd want to have an arborist that we pay for um, provide recommendations and advice as to how it uh, how they be trimmed, especially the eucalyptus trees in front of the school. Um, th the same is really true with Edison. First of all, they need to provide the information that they haven't provided, and that'll let us know what they've trimmed, and then we can hit, take an arborist and go out and look at what they've already trimmed and kind of take the same approach with them, try and get them to, uh, to follow um, appropriate practices. If that doesn't work, then maybe we should come back and, and look at our ordinance and, and make it mm -hmm. more stringent. We Madam need Mayor. advance notice. I mean, they just can't show up on one day and start doing this. No, the, the, the ordinance requires that they give us advance the list notice. in advance yeah. and the map and the indication of where the protected trees are. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of information that they're supposed to give us in advance. Right. So um, I think we can use that information. So the first step, they, they have agreed that they need to provide that information <laughs> to us. And Madam Mayor, Madam members Mayor, of council, if I could add, if I could add to that, I, I've been going back through our ordinance, and you know, the, that section says that they have to give us the list, notice in advance, and all the information. The final sentence says, all such works shall require an annual permit and shall be governed by the performance standards and restrictions of this chapter, our tree ordinance. And our tree ordinance, back in normal tree permit, same way anybody else gets to prune a, a, a heritage or protected tree, is required to um, describe, have an arborist report describing how the pruning will be done to, con it to shall be conducted to promote the health of the tree. The standards shall include maximum size of limbs and branches. So we are in Titled under our current ordinance to require Caltrans, I mean Edison, to provide that same information. Um, the the only issue we get uh, some sort of a I think uh, a challenge is where the tree simply is maybe perhaps just too tall, you know, to to, to prune best um, and still meet the PUC standards for safety. I believe you know where, where I think you'll hear get a pushback from Edison. I think we have to push back harder. Is well if they just hack it off. 15 feet below the wires, they don't have to come back for a couple of years. If they prune it properly and safely and health, in a healthy fashion, they may have to come back next year and prune it. And there's nothing, you know, it, it, I, I don't plead anything about, about their situation as a PUC regulated utility it gives them a chance to say, well, we can't afford to prune it every year, so we want to hack it off in a fashion that gives us more time. So that's where, and I believe that's why why oranges like ours and Benicia's um, exist, because it, and and I believe we, you know, we're not doing anything that makes it, it may, we'll make it more, as we have said, as we kind of said, as, as we've said about um, cell towers, we don't have to, they don't, they don't have the right to do the cheapest option. They just have to do an option that allows them to, to, to be able to do their business. So the fact that it'd be more expensive for the Essen company to better prune trees around power lines because it costs more money is not a, is not a defense, and I think that's where we'll have to be pretty, pretty vigilant on just an education program with their staff and take it up the chain of command and go through their government relations folks and make them clear that when they come to do tree printing in in Ojai, they're going to be much more careful and open uh, in what they're doing. And I think we have at least what we have on the books. I think we have a, what we need to be able to, to protect our our urban forest. Madam. I have a question because they have violated the ordinance, but what's the consequence? 
I mean, that's a that that's a good question. Yeah, because I mean, who? What does CE care if they violated the ordinance? If there's no consequence, so I I don't think that it's something that we should just let let this ordinance sit. I think that we do really need, really need to look at it and and see how we can improve it not just um, try to deal with SCE now and, and try to minimize the damage or whatever, or minimize the damage in the future with Caltrans. Also, we need to find out if Caltrans is required to follow our standards. And um, I mean, if it has no consequences, what's, the, it's just like, you know what, doing what into the wind. And the, the other thing is, um, in this, this, pruning ordinance we also don't have anything about nesting birds and we don't have anything about the time of year that we're pruning so that's another thing too that within the city maybe we could say that there's a season which they can prune they can't come in in the spring during nesting season and they can't you know prune you know in the beginning of 100 degree heat especially in third year of a drought <laughs> so I, I i i would have to say that i would like to come back with some ways and some ideas on how to strengthen this ordinance so that we can tighten it up and, mm -hmm. and not only enforce what we've got now but also tighten it up so in the future we have a lot more muscle behind us rather than just saying you violated the ordinance and they say oh gee gee whiz you know they don't have to mitigate they don't have to come in and repair the damage you can file a claim with sce you know as an individual but I don't know whether or not, you know. And if I could have, and we do have, and we do have the authority to enforce it. We can, if necessary, go to court and get um, a, a writ of mandate from the court ordering Edison to comply with our ordinance. So, you know, we have remedies. Uh, I think the important point is, is that it, I don't think either side has been vigilant on this issue about, about, the, about the Edison permit process. I just want to comment that I agree with you and then I'll, is, and that is, we have enough on the books right now to stop and protect our trees, and we need to uh, strengthen our ordinance. Council Member Laura? And I agree, also agree. And I haven't, since this was an emergency item, I didn't read all the ordinances and the specifics. I just skimmed through it. But I'm, I'm glad Council member clap mentioned the isa because they're very good they have very good practices i've actually a client of mine gave me a, a cd with their program and i've gone through it all and learned the, the practices and the safety and i do believe that that would answer a lot of our questions in regards to, to putting on the books and holding them accountable for going through the s ISA program so so I do agree with that something simple but as a follow-up to just think about I know we're gonna have a discussion item or did we uh, are we, on our consent calendar there was the, about the trees uh, we're, we're taking money uh, right now instead of planning new ones maybe we could add a little bit of that money in educating our residents also how to shape trees since the beginning so we could try to avoid that problem because shaping starts two or three years after the tree is planting. So you know how to follow a lead, you know how to the size of branches that they're supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to be also proactive and show the utility company that we're really serious about it and that we're going to have, an, uh, if we, if we want to have a, a tree a city, uh, we need to implement, I think, these policies. So. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. Yeah, one last thing. Number one, what we have right now, we can, we have, we're able to stop what happened. You're meeting on Thursday, right? With, with Caltrans. With Caltrans. And uh, will there uh, report to us what we do? I think the arborist may be necessary. This may be uh, many months as far as really tightening up, but we, we still, thank goodness uh, Councilwoman Clapp got it stopped for now. So report to us what happens Thursday. I think the arborist definitely would be a good good plan. But what we have now, we have a lot to work with. So let's hear what they have to say and how willing they are to play ball. And SCE, as well. and SCE OK? So can we end it with that? You have enough su suggestions? One tiny question, and then we'll end it. Do we currently have an arborist on staff? We have in the past. Do we currently have a certified arborist? I don't think we have an arborist on staff. We have arborists that we consult with. Okay. So we could, we would have to take that approach. 
And Do you need any further direction from Ma council? Madam oh. Mayor, so one more thing. <laughs> I, and I also, again, I follow up with Hannah Beth Jackson's office and seeing how they could be a resource to us. Sound like they were really supportive, so maybe they could help out with something too. Any other comments? You have uh, enough direction from council? Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Clark, for getting this you, together so quickly. Mr. Fletcher, for the advice. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Is, uh, and you know, I, I neglected to ask if anyone from the public wish to speak on, on this urgency issue. Is there? I just want to say thanks. You guys are really on this, and it's really important. <laughs> okay, our next item is a discussion item, options to address no parking compliance on street sweeping days. Mr. Uh, Clark? Uh, Mr. Grant will be making this presentation. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, as I understand it, uh, this issue has come up several times over the past few years, over the past decade or so, which is uh, street sweeping. Uh, what we can do to, uh, options to improve the no parking compliance on street sweeping days. And uh, I, I did highlight, I guess, on the, uh, I think we have a new system here, make sure I can figure it out. Uh, mm -hmm. What's that? Oh, really? Let's see. I'll just give you the move ahead. Simple. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to first of all highlight a couple things. One is that the uh, the current efficiency is an interesting uh, statistic that I came up with, and that is we counted uh, we took the survey that was done in 2011 of all the cars on the streets over several periods. I think they surveyed three different street sweeping days. And they found out that uh, I think there was roughly 700 cars that were on the streets uh, during that street sweeping days. And if you assume roughly 30 feet per car, which is probably excessive, but just an estimated amount, we're still sweeping approximately 93 to 94 percent of the streets. So in one respect, we're having fairly high efficiency. I don't, yeah, but we can still get it better, of course. And then second of all, the catch basins were all updated as part of the MPDS. The MPDS regulations uh, is that acronym up there, and that's uh, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. And that is all focused on reducing pollutants getting into our surface waters and, and into our uh, watershed. And uh, these trash exclusion devices are inside the catch basin, and they're made to catch trash and other, uh, other unwanteds to get into the stream beds. So those have been installed, and they're catching quite a bit of litter over the past few years. It's a little more maintenance for the crew, but it's working well. Uh, another thing I guess I didn't put up there is we do have our, our bag ordinance. It was in, uh, implemented recently, and uh, that's also effective because uh, one of the things that you used to see in the streams quite a bit was the, the bags. I think we're seeing quite a bit less of that now, and it's been effective. It, it's probably the biggest blowing risk. You know, those things, uh, they seem to catch the dust devils, and it's amazing how high they can go up in the air. So we haven't seen too much of that lately. Uh, so in 2005, a little history, with, uh, there was a no parking program approved by the council, and it met resistance from the public initially, and it was revised to a public education program. And it became a, with the major folks as being a 72-hour parking limit was enforcement. We, we already had the 72-hour parking limit, but it wasn't being enforced. And uh, I think there's various, most of that's a code enforcement issue, which is complaint-based enforcement even at this time. Uh, so I think the thought there was a lot of cars are just left out in the street and the street sweeper never goes around and we see weeds or cobwebs on the car and we've seen a couple of those out there. Uh, the other part was downtown parking concerns that if there was no parking that it might restrict access to the downtown area. Uh, so it landed up being an education program uh, with outreach through some of the trash flasks that Arison puts out and so on. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, there was a sweeping was rescheduled to the first and third Tuesday for the entire city. You might recall it used to be half the city every week, so it was a bit complicated for most residents to understand when their area was going to be swept. So the word went. So they simplified the program a bit at that time. And then uh, they also rescheduled commercial sweeping in the downtown core to before 7 o'clock in the morning. So here was a, a few options that we could undertake to uh, improve uh, the program. Uh, I'll start with the most severe and, and tailor it down to the less severe. 
The first one would be a citywide no parking program. This is where we sign the whole city. And uh, it's very expensive for signs and enforcement for this kind of approach. It's unusual uh, to do this kind of thing. And I should say unusual, uh, one approach to signing the city is to sign the entry area. And I think there's some technicalities in the law about that, which uh, basically say that you can do certain subdivisions, you can just take care of that. Uh, and there are some cities, I think, that uh, Beverly Hills signs their entire city on the outside limits for things like uh, no overnight parking. So that can be done in different approaches up that alley. That's highly unusual, though. Most cities put signage on the street, 175-foot spacing that says there's no, uh, park, no parking during the sweeping days and uh, with fines associated with that. Uh, this approach for the whole city is about 2,000 signs, $150 each. Adds up quickly, $300,000. Uh, and, of course, enforcement is additional cost to that, with it, depending on the approach the police department took on that, uh, officers, cadets, or volunteers. So the total cost program, $300,000 plus the enforcement additional to that, and then the potential issues being sign blight and the cost of enforcement. Uh, the existing budget would have very limited capacity on that. Um, another approach would be a pilot, a pilot no parking program on select streets, and that would be to take a focused area where we see a severe problem and uh, reduce. It, it has big benefits in that it has reduced initial and ongoing costs. It uh, has a benefit where we can learn as we go. We can understand any issues we have and correct it without having a major investment already up front on signage and other issues. And uh, the enforcement approach uh, as a suggestion would be and discussion with the police department would be to start with a warning period and then uh, implement citations after this warning period is over. The cost significantly drops down at the ten dollars to $50,000 range. It's dependent on the scale of how many streets we cover, of course. And then uh, if we went with this approach, the suggestions would be to take a public outreach program uh, with the residents in this affected areas to gauge their support and, and get their input and ideas. Uh, and then the staff would return with this proposal. Next. Uh, there's another program here, be voluntary compliance with a concerted, uh, I think it's one back there, uh, with a concerted public outreach. And uh, this approach, I think, is what the intention was in 2005, to have a concerted effort. I'm not sure how much of that was done as far as the records go, or what I've heard from staff and public is there was minimal uh, effort on that public outreach at that time. And uh, so this approach, we could have a campaign where we focus on the days and the times in the target neighborhoods, try to get that message out. We could highlight the benefits of uh, not parking on the street during these days. It cleans up the streets. It helps reduce pollution. We could have quite a few methods to deliver that message. We could uh, put courtesy reminders on any vehicles that are on the street. That's probably one of the most effective we can do, the non-compliant vehicles. We can use door hangers in the neighborhoods to try to get the message out. The trash flash from E.J. Harrison might have some effect on that. Uh, newspaper ads, and we can even take the step of putting barricades out on the streets that are having poor compliance and say something up the alley of the idea there that tomorrow's street sweeping, please move your cars with the approximate times that they street sweep on that area. So this one uh, has even a reduced cost further, especially if we utilize temporary labor to put up the barricades and get out the uh, door hangers and that kind of thing. Uh, and it might have a suggestion on that would be we can do a baseline compliance count at this time and then look at it down the road after a certain period of time or a year or so and see how we're doing with compliance at that time. And uh, I guess the, the least costly approach and maybe the least uh, payback on it uh, would be the voluntary compliance with minimal change. And this approach would be just to take uh, and boost compliance by the outreach that we can do effectively at minimal cost. And uh, we can try getting volunteers to help with the effort. We can certainly use temporary labor as well. And uh, we can do even things like barricades and some outreach. We could even utilize the uh, volunteer police uh, to help follow uh, the street sweeper and, and go ahead and put notices on cars that are not complying with it. So it's kind of our minimal approach at the least cost. And it may have, uh, it would certainly have some effect as well. So there's kind of a full range here that uh, presenting to the council. I'd be glad to answer any questions or discuss further. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It has been an ongoing item. I am pleased to hear we do have 93% uh, compliance. 
There's nothing like a ticket to attract uh, somebody's attention. I would favor doing the select streets, and especially if we could change. Like for two months, we do. Don't I'm not picking on Drown Street, but let's say we do Drown Street. Okay, can we put the signs there? Do the do the warning. Let public know that we are going to start to t to ticket next time they're parked there. Okay, and then go ahead and ticket that neighborhood once or twice, and I guarantee that we would have gotten the public's attention. Then move to another problem street. Is that a possibility? I, I don't want neighbors to feel that they're getting picked on. Um, we certainly don't want to put street signs everywhere. But I would like to bring up compliance to like 96 or 97 percent. And I don't really think we getting people's attention. There's nothing beats a ticket. Um. My inclination is to start with uh, the voluntary compliance again, again. <laughs> because, you know, how effective, effective is it if we have never truly enforced it? I mean, if we have just made a statement here and somehow expected the community to understand what we wanted, then that really isn't a fair demonstration either. So what I would like, is to, for a short to six months, try the volunteer compliance, and then if it doesn't, if, if we're not getting a, a result we want, then move to the pilot no parking program. Any other comments? Questions, council? Uh, Madam Mayor, I think we could probably do a mixture of the two programs maybe where you have the voluntary compliance you have some door hangers and some public uh, that'll educate the public and then see how it works once you've in, is, isolated an area a street that's a problem and do some door hangers saying that they can't park on the street on certain days and see if that has any effect if it doesn't have any effect and i think that'd be fairly easy to to track as to whether there's less cars on on those mm -hmm. those difficult streets then we see what else we should do but I think we I don't think the door hangers would be that expensive I think yeah absolutely the door hangers maybe putting uh, putting uh, something on the cars that are parked there too mm -hmm. well it would be the cost of staff wouldn't it how would the door hangers get there well volunteers Volunteers. We've got everything yeah. voluntary to temporary labor to Those staff, so we've got a variety there. <laughs> Boy Scouts, possibly. We'll see what's out there. There's some I know that some of the schools or the kids uh, need sure. to get out and do some public service programs, so we can search that out. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Council Ma Member Laura? I'm just curious, what was the opposition in 2005? Why were the, why was it such... It's not fully clear from the administrative reports on it, but it appears there was a lot of public opposition to all the signage potentially actually going up when it was voted through, as oh, well so as... it had uh, to do more with the signage. The signage, the blight, and also the fact that uh, people didn't quite understand, I think, when it happened, that their neighborhood was going to get signed up and possibly ticketed. So I, I, I understand also there are certain neighborhoods people just don't have an option, so uh, they need to be on the street, so there had to be some more thorough thought about how to implement that. You know, you can't just say no parking on the street. You have to say one side of the street and flip it to the other side, so they have some options. Okay. And, I, and I agree with Council Member Blatz on, on probably doing a combination of three and two, so I like that. Okay. Any other comments? No. Public? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this item? Mr. Eicher? Just, just some um, general comments, really, as a resident. Um, Drown and Fulton would be problematic for this street sweeping because I doubt there are very many people who park off the street on Drown and Fulton. You go on to Park Road, and those of us who live on Park Road, if, um, most of us have driveways we can park in, and if we don't, We've got a couple of acres of parking lot right across the street that we can utilize to get out of the way. Um, you know, so that, that sort of thing is going to be problematic. Signs definitely will be a problem because it will decrease already narrow sidewalks throughout the city.
making it even more impossible for people to pass along the sidewalks. Um, if you're a baseball player and your batting average is 930, you're guaranteed Hall of Fame right now. And so 93% compliance to me seems pretty darn good. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering just how much more, um, what will be the effect of really trying to grab another three or four percentage points or five or seven percentage points relative to the cost and, uh, and other things that go along with it. So just, just something to think about. Anyone else in the public care to comment? Okay, I'll bring it back to council. We've, well, we've received the, the report and we've discussed the options. Do, mm -hmm. we, okay. do we need to give you additional direction? So, so based on <coughs> the council comments, I think we would try the mixed program. Mm -hmm. So we'd identify those key neighborhoods, use right. the door hangers mm -hmm. and the, the notes on the cars and, and see how it goes and then come back and make a report. Okay. And, and I would like to have um, updates brought back to the City Council. I think one reason these programs get away from us is, is we feel that we have handled that, and now we move on. But if, if we don't keep ourselves updated, we're going to be right back where we were in 2005. So I would like updates on how it's going, what we might need to change. One more comment. The NPDES, it's on your uh, property tax bill. Uh, it's an item, to, and it's all for pollution. They are the ones who supply every city with uh, poop bags for dog poop. So we get all that is, is part of that money you pay for the NPDES is basically to make sure that dog feces doesn't get into the water supply. And one more comment. This this isn't exactly on subject, but I think it's it's uh, it's relevant. There's been a lot of, of discussion in our um, is it the uh, one of our planning <laughs> uh, advisory commissions um, with the idea that we should reduce required parking requirements to encourage certain uh, building and this type of thing. And that's something I think we need to be aware of because anytime we reduce on-site parking, we have compounded our street parking. And one section in particular, um, of course I can never remember where I am, but one section I know that we we approved parking by permit. Oh, near, near the, near by the, the church. By the food, by the, the, the farmers. By yeah. And so that's something that we need to be aware of. That type of thing, uh, with the condition of our streets, that type of thing is not going to work to keep our streets clear and clean. So, any other comments? Madam Mayor, yeah, real quickly, so what you're saying is like exempting somebody from the off-street parking requirement mm -hmm. if they're doing a remodel or something of that sort. Yeah, because you're instantly impacting the street because if they don't have the off-site, on-site, they're going to go right onto the street. You're right, absolutely. And, and I don't know if we still have it, but we had the uh, parking in lieu program. Yes. We probably still have it. I think we need to look at that type of thing because every car that's on the street is impacting our streets. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? You have enough direction from us? The public has spoken. We'll go on to our next item. Request for proposals for a facilitator for the visioning process. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, the purpose of a community visioning process is to bring together all sectors of a community to identify problems, evaluate changing conditions, and build a common approach to improving the quality of life in the community. Having said that, there's a lot of 
different ways to um, approach community visioning. Um, in talking with the city council about this when we were going through our goal setting session, it was pretty clear to me that the council wanted to proceed quickly with the process and also that you wanted it to be um, inclusive in terms of uh, public input. And so in researching how other communities have approached uh, community visioning and also drawing on my own experience with it in other communities, um, I put together an RFP that really is focused more than anything else on drawing in some people that we haven't had participate in municipal affairs in the past. Um, so th the RFP that I've presented here provides sort of a broad outline of how um, a visioning process might work. It also commits us to heavily supporting that with staff efforts and asks um, consultants to um, use their creativity to um, fill in the details of how it would work. But one of the main things I've suggested is kind of a, a two-step process. The first step would be to be working with stakeholder groups to identify initial concerns. And I've suggested that we use our city boards and commissions as five of the stakeholder groups, but that we also invite members of the community who have not typically been involved in municipal affairs to form several other stakeholder groups. And the groups I suggest are a business operator group, an environmental group, a student group, a Spanish speaker group, and a resident group. Um, I've, I've done this before in another community. And when we invited people in identified groups like this to participate in a process, um, even if they were not people who were inclined normally to get involved in municipal affairs, they were actually, frankly, honored to be selected and to be invited to participate. We had a fairly high level of, of participation. Um, and then I know from looking at the processes used in some other communities and talking to the consultants who worked on those processes that that's been tried in other places as well. So the idea would be that the consultant um, with the support of city staff would facilitate these groups as focus groups in doing sort of the first part, which is identifying issues, identifying changing circumstances um, that need to be addressed by the community. And then the second part would be a more broad workshop that these focus group members would be invited to, but anybody else who wanted to participate would be invited to. And that would be more focused on identifying solutions and future directions for the community. Um, the, we had initially put $10,000 in the budget for this process. I couldn't actually find anyone who did it f that cheaply. <laughs> um, but I did get the feeling from at least one consultant that if we doubled that budget and also put down a lot of staff time, that we could, with, uh, with $20,000, have a, um, a, a process where they would train us to facilitate. And so, and so they may have one or two staff members, and we would provide the other three or four staff members to facilitate the focus groups, and that we might be able to do it on a $20,000 budget. Um, I also I put together a list of potential um, bidders on this, which are all planning firms. And the reason I did that is that um, focus groups and uh, visioning for various types of projects is the kind of work that is typically done by planning groups. But if there are other individuals or companies that you think should be added to this distribution list, the more the merrier. And the idea would be is that we would, we would issue the RFP to all those on the list and all those who are added to the list and then see what we get back and select from that um, the group that would be the facilitator for our process. I, I would comment that I don't think it's necessary that it be a local group. Um, I think it's more important that the facilitator understand how these kinds of processes work and how to do facilitation because the content really should be drawn from the participants and, and, the, and the facilitator should not be telling us how our community should be, the facilitator should be helping draw that out of us so that it's, it's a bottom-up process coming from our participant community members. 
So um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about the RFP. The recommendation is to authorize us to issue the RFP and also to increase the budget from ten to 20000 I have a comment I'd like to make. I, I advocated for this, and I did not... I obviously was not as clear as I should have been. Uh, this, this type of full-scale visioning process is not what I had in mind. We had a, uh, a full visioning process about three years ago. Yeah. It was very intensive. And, and that, so doing that again is not what I had in mind. Pardon? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confused. I thought this was a community visioning versus a council visioning. Is there something I'm not understanding? Uh, uh, council Member Clapp is correct. This, this structure is, it's, it's intense. It's probably more intense than what we did three years ago. But it's more focused on input from the community and less focused on, on the council setting goals for the community. But we're not locked into it. In, okay. In the whole reason to bring but this what up I'm is saying is that we, I believe we can accomplish the same type of thing. What we, what, what we as the council wish to achieve, I believe, is direct communication input from different segments of our community. Um, we have, we've established goals on behalf of the community. What I was looking for is um, feedback and exchange between those groups. But more on an informal, more of a, a, I've gone blank here, more informal on a smaller scale. That's just, I don't want to invest $20,000 at this point for this, for this type of uh, review. Um, I think we have some other things that right now are more important. Questions, comments? Mayor Pratim Smith? Uh, frankly, I agree. Uh, I also think we have an election coming up. We're going to have a lot of seats on council. I think it would be extremely useful to have uh, potentially new council members participate in this type of visioning workshop. I feel we did have one fairly recently. And uh, when I read it too, I had the feeling, wait a minute, I think this is not really what the mayor had in mind. Though for the long term, I think this is an excellent idea, but I don't know if this summer is the right time. And I think I agree with, uh, with Mayor Strobel, this is not what she had in mind for this summer. So I would suggest we put this on hold for right now and think about a much less formal setup for perhaps in engaging, you know, I'd like to engage people who don't normally come here. You know, we, ha we have a core group who come. How can we engage other groups? How, how can we interest them in what's going on? I think we could have a workshop on that type of thing and somehow incorporate in the groups, like we're having a workshop on the um, a leaf blower ordinance this Thursday, right? I'd like to see people show up for that and all. But this, this, uh, this, the formal visioning process, I think, is a fantastic idea, but I think it should hold off until perhaps a, a, a year from now. Council Member Laura. Madam Mayor, uh, thank you. I, my understanding was more having to do with the council visioning and goal setting, and possibly our commissions involved. And I think that's where I was coming here. I mean, this is fantastic. If we could do this and include the community, it'd be great, in my opinion. Uh, it's very intensive. I, I still think that we still need a vision and goal within this council, possibly our commission and our boards, our appeals boards, et cetera. I think we need that every year just to keep it alive and see what other issues have arose. It's just a good practice in my opinion. And I know that we are having an election this November, but I still think that we should look at our goals and our our objectives and our some of our policy and, and invite the public to it. I I don't think it could be it has to be this intensive, but I still think that we should do it and maybe 
maybe just cut out the community, the special interest group, and see if there's an organization that will come and facilitate a visioning and goal setting. And just to comment on that, the, the information that I would find valuable is the information from the special community groups in this type of thing. Because I think as a council, we have done a lot of work on our, our goals and our objectives, and we just went over them as a council in February. Mm -hmm. So to me, what I was more after is what the community feels, what the community sees that uh, they would like to see happen. Just to continue that, that conversation, but um, how do we get them to join us for that conversation? Okay. Well, and, and going back to when we talked about our goals and envisioning, in my understanding, we are doing a lot. We, as a council, we are bringing a lot of issues. But some of the, the, the problems that I have is when we talk about maybe the lighting ordinance or when we talk about the most recent one, the styrofoam ordinance, how we applying that to our ultimate goals, our ultimate visioning. And that's where I was struggling when I brought up the sustainable, sustainability roadmap or we're, we're not even following that policy. We, haven't, we adopted it in 2008. But where are we filling in the gaps? How we, and this is kind of my attempt to say, okay, maybe we do need an annual visioning and goal setting workshop for the council to see where we're at and, and what we're, our issues are. Because frankly, every year things change. We, we're in the middle of a drought. We haven't really addressed that. What would we like us to do? Do we, I mean, and so it just keeps going on and on. And I think it's as a good business and we are city business and, and we're trying to figure out what we what is best to do with the money that our citizens are are basically paying where is that going and i think we need to be we need to be uh diligent about knowing what we want as a council so that was my point of view and i i think that i, I still think that it's important for us to have this this uh, goal setting, vision setting, whatever it is, and I think we should still uh, do it this summer, so. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Madam Mayor, I think that, that the, uh, the basic premise that's outlined in this proposal is exactly what we should do. Uh, I'm with the council, I don't know whether this is the right time to do it or not, but I really think that one of the things that we sorely lack is these special groups in our community communicating with us because they very seldom do. Every once in a while they do over specific items and interests and things that happen out there, but I don't think we have a really good sense of you know, what parts of our community really want. So I'm in favor of, of something this elaborate and putting together a visioning like that for us. I, find, I would find that to be far more helpful than going through the exercise a visioning that we did uh, about a year ago. For me, I would love to hear what some of the people in the community are saying uh, they would like to see and what they have, what their vision of the community is, because after all, we're here just serving them. So uh, I'm all for this. I can't say that we want to spend the $20,000 now. I go along with the rest of the council. But this is exactly the kind of thing that I was hoping that we would see. I think it did go beyond what the mayor asked for. But I was happy to see it when I got the packet. Council Member Clapp? Um, yeah, I think when we had the, the council visioning, we had discussed had taking it the next step to the community as well. And also it would segue beautifully into uh, the neighborhood visioning, the neighborhood uh, planning. Planning, planning. Because that's, you almost could do two birds with one stone with that because you can get a real sense from that visioning maybe the direction that we want to go with the neighborhood planning as well. But I think your point is really well taken that in the fall, after the election, would be the better time if there's a new sitting council at that point. Because that way um, it would be, it would just be more effective. More festive? More, well, maybe that too, more but festive. more effective.
effective. effective. Yes, more effective. Too. Yeah, uh, Madam Mayor, I don't, I don't see this process taking a short period of time. How long do you, do you see this from beginning to end? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think first of all, I think it would take till August or so to get someone on board. But then, if if you have ten groups that you have to facilitate, mm -hmm. it depends how many facilitators you right. have. You know, that could take mm. months to right. to go through. Okay. Say, I don't think the election has anything to do okay. with it. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I really don't. I think that uh, I would. I'm swinging back uh, yeah, the other yeah, way. Yeah, I I think that uh, if we want to wait and see what the budget looks like overall before we say go for it, I don't think that's going to jeopardize much time. Uh, but I'm kind of in favor of, of a real aggressive, well thought out visioning for people in the community to give us feedback. Mm -hmm. I really well, like that. It sounds like we have the majority of council support to go ahead with this. And so why don't we go ahead with this and, and uh, you know, put it to a vote and include it in the budget? Yeah. Council well, Member Blatt, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> Council yeah. Member Well, just real quickly, and I think it's important that we don't do it halfway. Right. That if it takes the 20 to do it, mm -hmm. we need to do that because we shouldn't th throw good money after mm -hmm. bad, you know, it should be. Yeah. And I'd kind of like to deal with the public system. Yeah. Okay. Anyone in the public care to address Mr. Iker? Well, I'm just up here all night tonight. Um, <laughs> When you're talking I about wanna, I want to make a comment before you start. These lights are really bothering my eyes. Yep. I'm not being cute here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I know they're horrible. Next week it's a Harley, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> Next week it's the leather jacket. Um, I think when it needs to be on an agenda. When item, you're talking about uh, <laughs> a community visioning process, uh, is there gonna be a residency requirement? No. I'm just curious. I mean, so you're you're not you're going to have people from outside the city telling people inside the city how things should be done in the city, but you're not going to allow people on a planning commission from outside the city to tell us what to do inside well, the city. Change that I'm story. just making I'm just making a statement here. I wondered, you know, how wide is your community and 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 how many people are going to be participating? Because we did do this, I believe, five years ago with Steve Bennett. On a, on a county, on a community wide from Oakview through Upper Ojai, and there was a huge process that was about six months? Yeah. Well, yeah. We did it three times. Yeah, three times. So that was, there may be something you can get a hold of from Bennett's office that has some information on that. Okay, and I saw a couple of, was that Michelle's hand I saw behind okay. Scott's? And you dropped your phone. Or someone's phone is on the floor. My phone yeah. flew to Washington, D.C. <laughs> recently. And give us your name. <laughs> Michelle Thomas, 1125 Del Prado Court. Um, Andra, who lives at 1125, also has another home in, in D.C. Her boyfriend accidentally got the phone. So anyway, what I wanted to say, well, that's how it's there. So it's, I know it's his. Um, I was really looking forward to this process starting as soon as possible and I hadn't this is a really good point um, I don't know your name Scott. Scott is bringing up about county versus city but can't we just start with a city since this is the city of Ojai and just start with neighborhoods and I I don't mind seeing money spent if you guys think it's important but why can't we just facilitate ourselves I mean we did pretty good with one big subject well that was sort and of my idea, but no, I, yeah, okay. Um, I'm just thinking. And are you dividing it up? Is it neighborhood visions? Like, what is our vision of our little area? And then say, going into the overall feeling of what we want from the city of Ojai. So you start with the little groups, and as to how you get people involved in those, uh, announce it. Do the signs something but I was looking forward to it that's all I want to say so I hope it starts as soon as possible thank you Welcome. Andrea it is so good to see you <laughs> um, as a former youth of Ojai I, I can speak about uh, reaching out to youth I think 
Um, I'm perhaps getting ahead of the whole process, but I think it would be great if you all reached out to the Ojai Valley Youth Foundation. There are a lot of incredible, motivated young people who want to say, have a say in how their city's progressing. Create an internship. Talk to the school district for a young, a 17, 16, 17-year-old kid to be able to say, I participated in this visioning project for my local community. That's inc an incredible opportunity for any student. We have a lot of really smart kids in this city. So I, I think that if you create some sort of leadership opportunity for kids, that's how you get them involved. And then they can canvas the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, is there anyone else in the public wishing to speak? Then I'll bring it back to the council. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. I love that idea because number one, First, we'd have to identify the neighborhoods. Then we would send out invitations to perhaps a workshop just with the, let's say we call it the Topa Topa neighborhood, okay? And on that workshop, we'll have five or six items that we're, we want to cover. It's certainly the uh, objective of what they want the houses to look like, the trees, the streetscape, etc. And then after we've identified uh, the, what, what we want as the real boundaries of the neighborhood, then we would have brought in all these people to part of the, pro the, pro the process. I mean, to me, we have about at least six or seven identical <laughs> neighborhoods. And what if we had a workshop uh, once every t two months or something with the council, invite everybody in that neighborhood, you know, give them the agenda ahead of time, I think they're more likely to, sh a good proportion will show up when they see these, we, from out of this, we may be making decisions that affect your neighborhood. We wanna hear from you. And so maybe in the course of a year or two, we would cover all the neighborhoods that way. But I think what Rod has outlined here is a, a whole different scope, yeah. okay? So we have these two things going. But I think I personally would get, be very excited if I got a letter from the city about having a, uh, a neighborhood workshop on what's important to that neighborhood, what are their issues, height limits for buildings, tree standards, all that type of stuff. So we would get that feedback and we would incorporate a good percentage of that neighborhood coming in. So I would love to see that and that we could start as soon as, as we can. And I think uh, both of the Belknaps thought it was enth enthusiastic. We've talked about neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know. so, and it, and uh, Madam Mayor, uh, in uh, furtherance of, of uh, Councilwoman Smith's comments, where you have, Mr. Clark, uh, business operators, environmental group members, students, Spanish speakers, and residents, I think maybe if you could, instead of having it by, by a class of, of people of business or youth, although youth is one that probably would be one that you'd want to have as a class, but then divide it by neighborhood, the best you could, then I think we're going to cover all of this, and maybe commercial. Uh, I think that we're going to cover these groups by having it by neighborhood, and I think that that is going to perhaps kill two birds with one stone when we're doing the idea of the neighborhood planning and also visioning. And we can take the information that we receive maybe on the neighborhood planning out of it. Now, I what do you think of that? I like so, that idea also. So I did, yeah, so, so I did discuss that idea with one of the consultants, and, and they thought that a neighborhood planning approach to this would be a little bit different than this approach, um, and that it would be beneficial to combine the budget that we have for this with the budget for neighborhood planning to get a more thorough neighborhood planning mm -hmm. product. This this is this is more of a broad community-wide vision, um, not a neighborhood by neighborhood. You know, na na well, it could be yeah, but but na neighborhood planning is more focused on community design. So it's you know how wide is the street? It, does it have a sidewalk or does it not have a sidewalk? Are there hedges and walls in the front yard or is the front yard clear? What does the building envelope look like? Things like that. Whereas this goes beyond that typically and engages a lot of other topics other than neighborhood design but if so so who would be doing uh, let's say we had the funds to, to begin the neighborhood planning 
who would be doing that? Wouldn't we be uh, hiring a consultant? Yeah. yeah. So if we're going to, it seems to me we should be able to combine those two. Yeah. We're going to hire a consultant for the neighborhood planning. We're going to hire a consultant for the visioning process. We're looking at planners. I think they, that we should be able to do that together. So let me, let me suggest this. We, we have a scheduled discussion with the Planning Commission, I think on June 21st, of the neighborhood planning process. Let me take the comments that you've just made and bring that to them and see if we can craft an RFP that will then also bring back to you that's along the lines that we're discussing right now. And, and Madam Mayor, Mayor first Pro of all, we probably should talk with planning. What should we decide are our neighbors, neighborhoods, at least for the, to start with? You know, I mean, I remember so they, for years we've been playing this, the downtown neighborhood, Topa Topa, you know, West so of the, Ojai. So the planning, you know. the planning Commission thinks we've already done that when we did our um, uh, tree, was it the tree plan? Yeah. Did we? We named the neighborhoods? Yeah, it, it identified 20 neighborhoods. Oh, great. I'd love to see the documents. So, and and yeah. they're pretty logical. You know, okay. They're, they're, it's, they're kind of organized by the time when they were developed which and they were they have certain titles like Soho and stuff <laughs> okay yes. uh, madam mayor and, and I really think that we're going to be able to get the the broad picture of of what the community is looking for out of the smaller community groups as well because they're not only going to be facilitated in saying what they want their neighborhoods to look like but they're also going to be facilitated to talk about the city as a whole mm -hmm. And I think that that even has a little bit more appeal to me. I'm excited about yeah. this. Okay, now, now I've swung back to the other way again, where I was. Any uh, additional comments, questions? Madam Mayor, I, I just, I, I definitely agree. I absolutely think that we, we should start this and do as, uh, and have staff do as much as it needs, needs to do in terms of compiling information or maybe we do just need to facilitate just to facilitate the meetings because it sounds like there's going to be quite a bit of them and uh but i also i i, I want to see if we could encourage other commissions to join in because being the, the liaison to different commissions i feel like every commission has their own goals and their own objectives and maybe somehow incorporating them into the process would have some congruency within them, us, and the public, and they could have a more idea of, of what the public is really looking for. I, I mean, that's I think my that, I think that is the idea. If you look at page 3-4, at the bottom there, it talks about stakeholders. At the very bottom, it says city boards and commissions list all of our boards and commissions. So, well, I, I understand. So th they'd be included. Right. And, and, and so, however, I just would like them to be in, in, along the whole process because it's, it's really important for them to hear, to hear everybody and see what their needs and what they value most, and in my opinion. So. Council's pleasure. Uh, Madam Mayor, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to authorize the city manager to issue a request for proposals for a facilitator for the community visioning process as we described and to increase the budget for visioning process from 10,000 to 20,000. Second. Roll call. Flat. Yes. Clap. Yes. Lara. Yes. Smith. Yes. Strobel. Yes. And Madam Hi. Mayor, real quickly, just for clarification, as as we described being the, the merging of the community community planning, planning and, and the vision. neighborhood vision or whatever, yeah, okay. That's correct. Okay. Okay, next on our agenda, the appointment of the Historic Preservation Commission. Lighting ordinance. Appointment, what? Lighting ordinance. Oh. Sorry, lighting ordinance implementation. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, we've been in the process since last August in implementing the lighting ordinance. And one of the key issues there is, um, although the, 
gist of the ordinance is focused on new lighting that's installed around town. There are some regulations that relate to existing commercial lighting. And we've been trying to develop a standard or a guideline so that we can identify whether a light is needed for safety and security purposes. Because the ordinance says that lights that do not comply must be turned off at the end of business hours unless needed for safety and security. So we've been working with this on this for some period of time. We've had several outreach meetings and we've come up with, with a series of criteria um, that we would accept, which basically means we would leave it up to the business operator to decide whether they need it for safety or security. So for example, um, lights which otherwise meet the quantitative trespass requirements of our ordinance, we would automatically accept if the business operator felt that they were needed for um, safety or security after business hours. Um, lights that are downward directed and fully shielded, same thing. Um, lights which meet um, Title 24 smart lighting standards. And we've come up with several other criteria and tried to vet these as well as we can with the, uh, with the uh, commercial operators as well as those who've been advocating for the lighting ordinance. And I think we've come up with a decent balance here. I do have a question before we start uh, discussion. And we have a list connected to this report. It starts on page Um, 4-12 and it's entitled identification of non-essential commercial exterior lighting one of the things when we were going through this process of approving a lighting ordinance was that we were not going to make it retroactive this list seems a little retroactive to me. So how do we, how do we? Uh well, there's, there's a couple things. First of all, the, the list is just an example. It's, it's, it w it's not an enforceable list. Um, but secondly, there are provisions in the ordinance that you adopted that apply to existing lights. And the, the main regulation that applies to existing lights in the ordinance that you adopted is that lights that do not conform with the standards um, of the that are required for new lights are to be turned off at business hours at the end of business hours so that's I, I guess you could okay, call it retroactive we, yeah. yeah so there so this is this the um, the resolution is trying to find a reasonable way of dealing with that operating requirement council uh, mayor pro Tim Smith I, I appreciated this list. Not, I think it gives us uh, a real basis to talk to owners or something if they're remodeling or the changes. Also, maybe they have a lot of these lights on and they don't even realize they, they're really not performing what they think they, they should do or what. So I think I, I appreciated this list. I did not see it as retroactive or that we're going to force a business owner to adhere to them. I appreciated the list also. I just want to be very clear no, it's, it's not a retroactive. that it's not a retroactive Absolutely list. Absolutely not. I, I, I neglected to also say that we're in the voluntary compliance period. Mm -hmm. So our approach is going to be more educational and, you know, informative and that kind of thing. And then we'll come back after the thing's been in place for a year and ask the council to assess where we are and, and how, we should go for, how we should proceed going forward. So we're not going to issue citations to people for having lights that don't comply. We're just going to say. And, you know, but we're going to use this list to attempt voluntary compliance. Is that the idea? We're going to use the, the, the guidelines may result in a slightly different outcome than the list. The list was just an a informal survey that was done to get a feel for how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but we will use the guidelines. So if, if there's a complaint that business X has lights on after business hours that are too bright, we'll first see if they fall within any of these categories in the resolution. If they do, it's really their call. If they don't, then we'll get in touch with them and try and explain to them why um, their lighting's too bright. 
Additional comments, questions, Council Member I, Lara? I do have a question. You said he had two uh, gathering to a uh, public here or workshops about it outreach meetings yeah. outreach meetings how well were they attended um we had about a dozen businesses <laughs> attend the first one and none attend the second one <laughs> and their more their concern was more about the tv tv lights um the the primary concern that came up at the first outreach meeting that's addressed by this is the um um businesses that operate on a 24-hour basis like hotels and motels and ATMs because um, they really don't have a closing time and what's the standard that's appropriate. And so we did some research and we found that the Dark Sky Association actually has a standard for that. And so we decided we would use that standard as to what is sufficient and use the um, commercial area downtown as the brightest uh, light. Um, they did have another concern which re isn't really addressed by the resolution. Um, which was that they felt there should be more options for decorative lighting beyond Tivoli lighting. And so that's something that we'll bring forward to you when we um, review the ordinance at the end of the year. And uh, looking at this list, uh, I definitely do appreciate the list too. It's a lot of work put into it. I did, uh, uh, Chief, the Chief Kenny, did you have any opinions about if some of, turning off some of these lights would make it no, more I, dangerous, I safer, or? I attended the presentation by a, a consultant, was it about a year ago? Yeah. And he showed, I didn't have any concerns with what he, he uh, showed council and the Association of Chiefs of uh, Police have done studies on this. And the, what it shows is that the lighting really has no effect on crime. It has the effect on the perception that people feel safer, but truthfully, are they safer? The lighting has very little to do with that, so I don't have a problem with it. Okay, because most of the essential lighting was at at uh, motels and ATMs. what I saw ATMs, et cetera, et cetera. But I did notice that at the park, we did end up adding some lights because of of safety issues, is that correct? We we did uh, in the arcade, or maybe that may be what uh, you're thinking of. We, we did brighten up some of the lighting in the back of the arcade for security reasons. Yeah, and there's, and there's also pedestrian safety and things like that at crosswalks and all of those areas as well. Okay. That you all need right. to uh, consider. Okay, thank you. Any other Councilman I just would like to go on the record that I I'm disappointed in the sliding ordinance that the one that we had before was much better and that not having uh, shielding be a component of the of the ordinance is a real mistake and that I would hope in the future that we address this again and make shielding a requirement for both residential and business any other comments questions Anyone in the audience wish to address this, this item? Uh, Dale Hansen. I, um, my understanding is that shielding is part of this ordinance. It is to be, the, the standards are to be directed down to where, it, where the light is needed and not just out. Am I, am I incorrect? Mayor, would you like me to respond? Yes, please. Hey, so new lighting does have to be shielded and downward directed. What we're talking about, um, have been talking about, is what about existing lighting? Oh, existing And lights, so yeah. for existing lighting, such as a porch light on a residence um, or in a commercial building, lights that are on after the close of business, um, those, they do, when they're on, they don't have to be shielded, but they are supposed to be turned off at 10 o'clock for residential lighting or after yeah. business for commercial lighting. Okay, well, that's how yeah. I understood it. And then the exception, lighting. yeah, right. Sorry. And then the exception is for... Um, uh, safety and security reasons, and we're trying to figure out what exactly does safety and security mean, and so right. this is intended to define that. I see. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Madam Mayor? And I have a quick comment or question, then I'll come to mm -hmm. you. Um, on page 4-3, we it discusses a preliminary concern, or a primary concern, having to do with uh, adequate light for safety and security overnight at hotels and motels. My question is, 
does that category, would that category include extended stay? So um, um, Section E is the one that would govern, and it says um, lighting fixtures necessary for 24-hour operations such as automated teller machines, night depositories, hotels, and motels. And we actually further clar clarified that to say in the resolution in non-residential zones. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Council Member Clow? Uh, just some clarification for Dale. The original lighting ordinance had a shielding component in it so that if you had a, a light in your neighborhood say that was unshielded there was a component within the original ordinance that we got rid of that would give you the ability to get that light shielded you can't do that anymore yeah but were we enforcing that it, well, like all codes, we were forcing by complaint only. I see. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else in the public wish to speak on this item? Council? Any more comments? Council Member Laura? Yes, Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor. It's. Uh, I really lead towards the safety issue and, and wh whether it's essential or non-essential. I absolutely appreciate Chief Kenny's uh, uh, feedback about how it really doesn't increase, it's just a perception. So I, I feel that, I mean, it's all about educating our commercial businesses if we're gonna to adopt this and we're gonna basically establish the guidelines to the commercial lighting, I think it's gonna be really important to give them the, inf the right information and, and back it up. Uh, and, and again, I, I think that we should, I don't know if, if the Chamber of Commerce would uh, support it or not. I, I mean, my, my thing is, if we're gonna adopt this, we're, we just gotta go out there and re, be proactive and hopefully enforce it if if council um is if it's council's pleasure any other questions comments from council i just have one comment i can appreciate uh, the chief's comment with regard to lighting and that it may not have a direct relationship to crime but we have a lot of visitors to this town and i've had a couple of them say that it is so dark if they're just walking up just north of Ohio Avenue on Signal Street after going to the movies, that it frightens them. Uh, and whether there's the perceived appearance that it causes more crime or not, I think we still need to be cognizant of that because we do have to, uh, we do have to worry about what people feel and how safe they feel in our streets. Okay, just to remind ourselves, the recommendation is to adopt the resolution which establishes guidelines for essential commercial lighting. That's just to get us back on track. Any additional comments? I mean, I understand the recommendations, but I, I feel like by accepting these guidelines, it is going to give us the ability to go to commercial buildings and show them this your lighting is not essential as essential so I think it's it's a really big uh, I guess re resolution in my point of view and, and and I I struggle with it because it is important for our citizens and our, our tourists to feel safe if lighting does perceive that notion is it true notion it's not so if we do adopt these, I think that it's really important for us to do outreach to educate our residents and our tourists if we're going to be doing this. I, I, that's how I, I mean, I, I just feel like if it, this is going to give us the ability to, to actually go out there and, and, and do it. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. Um, the other part is I think ado adopting this, trying to move towards shielded lights, I mean, Besides, I don't, if I'm walking on a dark street, no, I don't feel I'm going to be criminally attacked 
but I am worried I may trip or fall, not having the best eyes in the world and being of a certain age. So I think that's the other issue. We want people walking to feel, feel that they can see where they're going and get to their car. That could be accommodated with shielded lights, you see. So I think part of, I think, what Paul was saying was not only they couldn't, was feeling unsafe, was they could not see for sure where they're going. And that's a different issue than worried about you're going to be mugged. So, um, I, but the shielded lights and all can address those issues. And I'm going to make there? a quick comment and then I'll go back to you. Um, and I, I talked about this when we began, well, when we began, that was seven years ago. Uh, but over the course of, of discussing this, what I have discovered from my own personal experience is with the light, lighting technology available today, it gives better light with less wasted glare. So... I just wanted to reiterate that again, and if we can if we can get people to comply, that would be wonderful. And Councilmember Clapp, I just want to make one more comment about shielding. Shielding is it's much easier to see when you don't have a light shining in your face than when you do, particularly sure. if you have cataracts. So. Um, I guess I'm beating a dead horse. <laughs> well, but. If you have specific, um, I mean, I have a specific that I could point at right now. Um, has anyone made an effort to talk to, to the problem areas? Has, it, has the city made any outreach at all? Because it's, it, the list we have here is commercial. But there are, well, this would be commercial also. Are, are do we, let's say I decided to file a complaint. Uh, I feel that there's a light that is completely unshielded, too bright, unnecessary, and it's not turned off at 10 o'clock. So what would happen? So would, that, would that initiate an outreach? Yes, it would. And, okay. and part of the and part of the reason for this is is trying to figure out what we would tell um, that person. Okay. And yeah, there is. I, be I believe if it's unshielded and the little light meter says it's under a certain lumens, there's nothing you can do about it. Even though it's bothering you and shining in your bedroom, if the lumens from the light meter say that it's within the standard of the new ordinance, there's nothing that you can do about it. I, I know. Now, wait, let me finish. So the point I'm making is, which was why I'm disappointed in the new ordinance, is that there's no remedy that is left in place. That, that remedy of shielding has been removed with this new ordinance. It's purely on lumens now, and there's no recourse. And lumens is subjective it, when it's, when it's dark and your light your pupils are dilated 25 watts seems a lot brighter than in the daylight so it's also a very subjective thing at what level and brightness the light's going to bother you so shielding is a huge component with any light ordinance and that's why I will probably continue to encourage us to review this in, in the future and see and, and discuss it again and, and hopefully come to the conclusion that it would be much better to have that be an integral part of the ordinance. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, if I could ask uh, either Mr. Fletcher or maybe Mr. Fletcher, can, can lighting, even though it's, it may not be shielded and not required to be shielded in our ordinance, can it still be, in, can it be enforced by being a public nuisance? Um, theoretically, yes. Um, the uh, how we would establish that would probably require a significant amount of, of subjective evidence. If there's an, we have an objective standard um, about the lumens number, but yeah, in that, that particular situation, yes, could be if, if it's a unique, it's in a location that's particularly troublesome to neighbors. Yes, 
it could be and still the city. Public. I know civilly you could enforce right. it. Right. No, and if it's a public nuisance, not just a private nuisance, yeah. but a public okay. nuisance, um, then, then we can enforce that um, just as a public nuisance. Now, that's a, a fairly complex process, but we have that remedy for okay. the particular case. And, and there are private nuisance remedies, too. Okay. And then my other question is, there are some street lights that I've noticed that are very bright and unshielded. One uh, is at the corner of uh, Daly and Andrew. And a couple of people have called me complaining about that, and I went out and looked at it, and it really is bright. Is there any way that those lights we can ask uh, Southern California Edison to, to shield that light? Yeah, we can pay to have it shielded. <laughs> we could. We could. <clears throat> yeah. Right, the, we, we've adopted a standard that applies when they replace it on a routine maintenance basis, um, but in order to get them to change it out um, on another basis, you'd have to pay for it, but you could do that. And what's, what's just an approximate cost to shield a street light? $175. $240? Oh, I, 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 it's, it's in that range. I'd have to go back to get that. All right. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, I really think that if we get enough complaints about a street light, particularly where a street light is shining in someone's bedroom, or yeah. I think that that's a small price for us to, to pay to, to, to make a citizen happy. Mm -hmm. I really do. I'd like to look at, particularly look at that one. Sure. And then the other thing is I was looking back at, as long as we're talking about lighting, but it, it's a little off the point. I was looking back in the uh, the Arts Commission budget, there is some money in there for lighting, I believe. Okay, uh, and that lighting would be for uh, the tra the track lighting uh, for our gallery, up updating it with new uh, low energy lights and things. But also, I really think, and it's hitting home more now than ever with with the mayor, <coughs> that these lights are really bad after being in here for a, not only. Not only to us, but to the audience. I have a really difficult time after about an hour seeing, even reading, even with my glasses, to, yeah. after a while in this lighting. And I really think we ought to put some money aside to really do a, a good study in here and, and get some much better lighting. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah. The mayor We've got our pro <laughs> we have our protester over here. But I, I really do think that it's time that... We did something about the lighting in here for Yay. both the, the audience and us. Well, okay. well, you know, when my eyes were old and tired, oh, oh, that's when my eyes were old and tired, it didn't make any difference. But now they're bright and crystal clear. This is blinding. But another thing I would like to mention is that there was a time when we, um, in this council chamber, we used full spectrum right. full spectrum lighting that made an incredible difference we slowly over time went back to these because they're less expensive maybe we can get a grant hey greg uh -huh. get us a grant for new lights in are, are you hearing us back there <laughs> Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, we just See put it into the budget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These uh, lights are horrible. You know, we could get a thing going here. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, just to uh, get us moving along here, I'll make a recommendation to adopt the resolution which establishes guidelines for essential commercial lighting. I'll second with one comment, only if we enforce it. Mm. So, again, at this point in time, your direction to us is to enforce through voluntary compliance. Voluntary that is our intent. Yeah. Oh, with this one, I thought it was just residential. This, you know, we're yeah, this residential, the whole lighting ordinance Everything. for the first year is being done through voluntary compliance. At the end of the first year, which is August, we'll come back to you and ask you what you want us to do then. Okay. So my, my motion, yeah, my motion stands <laughs> as it was, and you're going to retract your I'll retract extraneous my, my extraneous I'll comment. <laughs> Roll call. Blatz? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Lara? Yes. Smith? Yes. Strobel? Yes. <laughs> Our next item is uh, appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I'll just give you a quick report on that because I'd like us to move along here. Um, we interviewed 
two applicants for the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the vacancy required a resident. Both applicants were uh, very well qualified. The subcommittee consisted of Council Member Clapp, Historic Preservation Chair McCready, and myself. And after the interviews, we recommend Brian Rooney. His application is attached. He is a, uh, a resident of the city, and his his resume is ex very impressive. So uh, we were is. all three very delighted to have him. I move to uh, approve that nomination and appoint Brian Rooney to the Historical Preservation Commission. Second. R O N E Y. I, I Rooney. Rooney. Oh, did I say Rooney? Oh, Rooney. sorry, I pronounced it wrong. You know, right? Yeah. I second. It's only one O, Roney. And let's have a roll call. Platts? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Laura? Yes. Smith? Yes. Strobel? Yes. And we did have good applicants, I must say. Next, okay, we're going to recess as the Ojai, have I missed an item here? No. Okay. There we're going to recess as the Ojai City Council and convene as the Ojai Redevelopment Successor Agency. Um, consent calendar items A and B. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Lats? Yes. Clap? Yes. Laura? Yes. Smith? Yes. Strobel? Yes. And we're going to adjourn the Ojai Redevelopment Successor Agency and reconvene the Ohio City Council. Any, any reports from council members? Madam Mayor, I don't have a report, but I am very concerned about the proliferation of yard sale signs on Ohio Avenue. Why is it that the same person who goes out and tacks them up all over the place seems incapable of taking them down, let's say, on Sunday night? It's, it's, it's every, at the end of every weekend, we have neon green, neon yellow, you know, signs hanging from every which way. Um, I know that the newspaper says, please take your yard sale signs down, but Literally, I, I'm thinking at this point, it, it looks blighted. I mean, I personally have taken down a bunch of them. But it's like, you know, everybody works in a work area, and they go to the, the break room, and there's a sign up like, your mother doesn't work here. Please clean up after yourself. So I'm just letting the public know that it, 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 on Sunday night, Ojai Avenue is, is a wreck from all these signs being left around. And also, there's a proliferation of lawn signs that some painter does a job and he sticks a lawn sign somewhere and he has free advertising and i think the general public thinks well it has to be a legitimate sign and there he is in somebody's lawn or someone's yard and they're not they have no business putting those signs there and leaving them so i'd like the public to be aware that just because the sign is there does not mean it should legally be there feel free to get rid of it you know and and the the, the lawn signs are just everywhere. I finally took one down for some soccer camp that had been stuck by the, uh, the Ojai Valley Inn there for months. It was falling apart. So be aware that the signs that people put up, please be courteous and take them down. But if you come across a yard sign that's been up there for two weeks, take it down. Perhaps deliver it to the yard where it still told you to go. But, I, I mean, it's really becoming, at this point, a nuisance. So... I just want people to be aware of it and pay attention to it, and it's, it's ugly. And I will mention that um, the Ventura County Animal Services has a new director. Her name is Tara Diller, Diller. Um, quite an impressive young lady. We invited her up to Ojai and Mayor Pro Tem Smith, um, Chief Kinney, 
City Manager Clark. And I was there anyone else? You were there. Oh, I, well, I was there. Yes, I was. Was that was that all? Is that it? Um, we probably met for about an hour and a half. Excellent communication. We learned many things. We learned that Ojai, the Ojai area, actually has an officer dedicated to it. I didn't know that, but Chief Kenny knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very good that we were all in the same room uh, learning all of this information. And so we have a, uh, a couple of things that we're going to do. I don't know if we have the numbers up or how we're going to do it. But just to let you know, some very good things came out of that. And we'll be doing um, some things that will give the public an easier, more immediate access regarding animals, especially animals off the leash. Councilmember Lori? No. no. Nothing? <laughs> Mr. Clark? I just wanted to say that um, the Ohio <laughs> Peace Month is over. It's now over. It's now over. Nothing. Mr. Grant, did you have, you almost always have comments. Something very quick, yeah, I want to mention that uh, two things. One is that I hope people notice that Aliso Street, we now have completed the sidewalks. So we now have uh, sidewalks on the south side of Aliso all the way from Signal over to Montgomery. So that's a nice finished project. And then on the north side, it's, not, it's from Lyon over to Montgomery. So we finished that sidewalk and bumped around the oak tree there as well. And secondly, I want to mention that uh, we did, we were successful, the grant that we applied for with the TDA grant for uh, Grand Avenue as well as the realignment of Grand where it hits uh, Summer and Signal. That was successful. So they picked us, uh, what was it, I think three cities were turned down and six were successful. So we made that one as well. It was good news. Yeah. Mr. Fletcher? Nothing. All right, we do have a closed session. Pardon? Well, if I didn't overlook someone at every meeting, I just wouldn't be consistent. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council, Norm Plott, uh, your fire chief for the fire department. Uh, just to let you know that the annual weed abatement compliance is uh, due on May 31st of this year. So that's when uh, residents uh, are due to have all their uh, clearance uh, done within the city limits and er any of the areas in the wildland. So that's coming forward. Also that there's... Uh, the fire department is continuing with our multi-prong approach for uh, fire safety and one of the projects that is going forward is a uh, Barlow Canyon uh, prescribed burning that will be going on throughout the year when conditions are uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, the one thing about that is that occasionally there might be a little bit of drift smoke that comes into the Ojai uh, if the winds blow from the southwest. Not a lot, but the idea is to prevent to create a buffer and uh, so that a wildfire doesn't from a southwest wind uh, end up in the city of Ojai so it gives us a chance a defensible space and so that project's ongoing and uh, the next day is June 4th that that will if conditions are right on that day so just to let you know you. and that's in a report chief I have a question sit down. Um, testing of fire hydrants at the city does the fire department have any program to make sure there's sufficient pressure and uh, uh, capacity on the fire hydrants? I've been working with uh, the city manager on a pro uh, program, be having a report to him shortly. But uh, yes, we do have a, uh, we do check the hydrants annually, uh, the engine company, and we have a, a PowerPoint that we've been putting together to kind of explain what the process is and where we were at and, and uh, as far as compliance with Golden State Water and some uh, where we are kind of going back through the history. So I'm, I've been working with fire prevention and we'll have a report to council uh, here. Uh, I believe it's uh, here next, right. next month. We appreciate that. So, Thank you, you. And I'll just add as a reminder that May 31st will be here before we residents know it. And that is the deadline for the weed abatement. Yes. Did I miss anyone else out there? <laughs> okay. At this point, we are going into closed session. We have two items. Um, the first is a conference with labor negotiator. 
this confused me, um, in quotes, the government code section 54957-6, agency designated representative, city manager Robert Clark, regarding non-representative non-represented employees. And the second item is conference with legal counsel uh, regarding an initiation of litigation pursuant to California Code Section 54956-9B4, one potential case. And Matt, Announcements? and we will not have, I will not have a report out on either item. Okay. We do not anticipate an announcement on either item.